and yeah, today I will kind of continue with some of the um, conversations that Gregor already started yesterday and connect some of the points and give some more examples and also generally give insights into what type of model um, structures um, and how they motivate different types of explanations. And this is, of course, kind of uh, very collaborative work, um, so it takes a bit of a village um, to, to get these things to work. Um, but first, I'm going to go a bit into an overview of like how kind of the whole field has developed a bit. So initially, when like the whole deep learning um, hype started, we were quite busy with like getting models to work and um, finding ways um, to deal with the large amount of data and to get um, them to perform well. And then we um, followed up with like um, a first wave of explainable AI or explainable 1.0, where we had these really complex models that now gave great accuracy. But like, yeah, we had to find ways and figure out what these models were doing. Um, and yeah, in this um, first wave, we kind of developed several different directions. I think Wojciech in his talk already uh, summarized it quite well. Um, yeah, and then we kind of uh, were quite good with more like standard models, for example, CNNs, and could do a quite good job to um, get them to work. Um, then a second wave of explainable AI, XAI 2.0 or X XAI. Um, kind of was more concerned with like, okay, now we have all these great explanations, but um, how can we kind of robustify them? How can we make them actionable? How can we kind of improve our models um, by using explainable AI? And how can we use them, of course, also for, for scientific insights? Um, um, but yeah, while we kind of developed these kind of new um, actionable ways for explainable AI, the community has developed more and more kind of models that um, perform uh, better in certain kind of communities. And really popular ones, for example, are um, transformers and graph neural networks. While initially there was a lot of focus on um, convolutional neural networks, and kind of with these new um, graph or like with these new model structures, um, there was a need to develop new explanation techniques, as I will show in in this talk. And we've all um, been quite recently witness to this. Um, constant wave of new models um, with the onset of, for example, Jet GPT, which was released last time, and it has kind of um, reached unforeseen kind of hype and um, use in, yeah, basically society. Um, and again, unfortunately, Jet GPT is like a black box model. Um, so and this is the case for most kind of new trending models that are really performant, but typically we have no idea what they are doing. So we kind of constantly need to come um, keep up uh, with developing our XAI tools further, and on, in this of course lies great uh, responsibility. Um, so yeah, just out of fun, I kind of asked ChatGPT uh, a few days ago why it kind of gave me a certain answer, and unfortunately. It's giving me an answer, uh, but of course it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, because it says I'm not capable of making decisions or generating responses based on my own motivations or desires. I do not have access to external data or the ability to perform any type of analysis or prediction. And importantly, I do not have personal preferences or biases. I'm simply a tool that has been trained to process and generate text. Uh, which of course sounds kind of nice, uh, but similar to, similar to what Ben you already um, presented on Monday, it's basically an awkward silence response, but now just with a bit of an answer that still doesn't tell you anything about the problem. Um, so yeah, there's kind of a lot of work to be done, um, and maybe this work that I will present next will contribute to this. Um, so in the next, I will focus on kind of three different um, distinct structures um, for which we have developed explanation techniques. Uh, we will focus on similarity models, graph neural networks, and transformers. Whereas we, for similarity models and graph neural networks, go into the realm of um, higher order explanations, um, whereas for transformers, we have developed more robust explanation techniques because naive approaches there do not give robust um, results. Okay, but let's start with uh, similarity models. Um, so the basic idea of a similarity model is, of course, that you kind of have some model, potentially complex and deep, that you then use to extract some representations that you then just kind of uh, compute as cosine similarity score for, for example, or just like a dot product um, similarity. And our um, goal here was to understand why this and how the similarity score has arised. Um, so this is a basic model that can do this. So fire our basic kind of, in this case, very nonlinear, uh, nonlinear but one layer kind of function. And we can just compute a dot product similarity and by using um, a Taylor expansion um, of this function, we arrive at a simple baseline of our um, um, explanation, which can be um, seen as a Hessian times product formulation. 
Um, maybe to make it more clear what type of explanations we're looking at here, um, I have an example here where you kind of give two input images, um, for example, of a plane. And the resulting explanation of why these two images are similar give you kind of the pairwise interactions between uh, the most relevant regions. So you kind of get these kind of second order explanations from these. And you can, as I said, compute these for um, very shallow and more simpler methods by using um, this, um, the Hessian of the function um, times the product of um, the inputs. Um, so this is kind of similar to the very popular gradient times input um, explanations in standard scenarios, for example, in image classification. Um, yeah, but now moving to more um, robust settings. So these type of simple gradient and naive computations do not work very well for deep neural networks. So we have kind of effects of shattered gradients and also kind of this root point selection that we need in order to get a um, performant Taylor exp expansion is difficult uh, for deeper me methods. So um, when we move to more kind of layered um, structures, which we typically do, um, for example, uh, using a VGG model or like a deep CNN, we kind of have several layers. And by this, then we kind of compute our representations successively by going um, in a forward way through these different layers. And then again, arriving at a representation um, at the end of our encoding network. Um, instead of a simple Taylor um, decomposition, we now do like something that's uh, called a deep Taylor decomposition, which was introduced by Grigoire, whom we saw yesterday. And um, with this formulation, we can um, more accurately um, describe our, our backpropagation paths and end up with a um, propagation rule that gives us um, a robustified version of a dehessian times in, uh, product formulation. And it looks something like this. So the propagation rule um, tells you basically how the relevance from some later layer um, is redistributed to the earlier layer RJJ. And um, the terms that play a role here are in this um, uh, function here. And maybe to just say it in plain um, words, <laughs> it probably makes it a bit easier, is that two neurons um, are assigned um, relevant for the similarity score if the, the following three conditions are met. So basically, they have to jointly activate. So the activations here need to produce like a positive score in order for the product to be kind of non-zero. Um, then the pairs of neurons in the layers above need to jointly react. So basically, this whole term also needs to be positive. Um, so this means that kind of the, the product of the weights times the activation, so what you typically do in a forward pass, needs to um, react to, to your pattern. And also, you need to have some relevance from the layer above, so the later layer in your network, that you can redistribute. And when you kind of have all these three conditions met, you kind of observe these kind of red connections that we saw earlier. So is this uh, depending on the kind of activation function you use? Um, we use Relu. We use Relu, exactly. So the kind of deep Taylor decomposition assumes kind of this homogeneity of your model function, and there kind of the Relu is one of the assumptions. If you kind of have different activation functions, then the theory doesn't hold as strongly, and so you cannot really formalize it in the framework of deep Taylor decomposition, but that you can still apply, of course, these type of um, so results. So uh, uh, um, yeah, if, if you do that, yeah, you can apply certain kind of tricks to still treat them in more robust ways, but it's a kind of, it doesn't basically then like not all higher order terms that here kind of vanish then in, in this step from here to here, then you still um, kind of have some kind of residual terms that do not become zero if you use other activation functions. But like, it can still be like a plausible assumption that you can make. Um, so yeah, I am... Um, but that's yeah, a specific scenario. So we always assume we really because it makes the uh, theory simple and kind of gets rid of the complications. In practice, we can do it usually, yeah. Um, yes, and then another nice way that we found, so um, you can kind of factor your explanations. Uh, so basically, the dot product can be factored into two terms that then you can compute your LRP explanations independently. So basically, instead of having to go um, number of output features times number of output features. You can just start from every output feature in each of your images and start one backpropagation path by masking one of the relevant output neurons and computing the whole relevant um, LRP um, scheme and then just recombining the features at the input. So this kind of yeah, really saves you a lot of computation time. Um, Yes, so yeah, yeah, with this uh, theory, we can now move more into the um, experiments. So in order to get like a first idea of how these things work and what, how we can also evaluate them, because it's very difficult to get ground truth data for similarity. Um, we kind of came up with this following toy scenario, where basically we have um, two sequences. 
of, um, of numbers and the similarity score is based on the matching between the two digits in, or the same digits in the two sequences. So for example, here there's two sevens. So they receive like a match um, and like a positive interaction and also like it's the same for the others. So uh, we kind of have some ground truth idea what the similarity score should be based upon. Um, and then we can kind of train a neural network to kind of uh, rep replicate these type of ground truth data and then test it uh, if our explanations and are able to match these properly. And since this is a somewhat new task to evaluate second order explanations, we kind of also had to come up with some benchmarks um, and how one could get these kind of second order um, explanations. So we use kind of the saliency, which is the product of the inputs, um, the curvature, which is based on the Hessian, um, and our already introduced Hessian times product baseline. So these will serve as kind of comparison um, models. And then um, with the resulting explanations that we get, uh, we can then compute the average cosine similarity to our ground truth data that we have um, designed. So looking at um, saliency and curvature, we see that they are very unspecific actually to attending to the relevant features. Um, so they have a quite low average cosine similarity score and are not super useful. Um, for explaining what the model is doing. In comparison, Hessian times product already improves quite a lot on it, but you still have a lot of contradicting evidence and negative um, um, relevance um, attribution. Um, but like it goes in the right direction. And as I said, like this is in fact due to this kind of shattering of gradients and like the problems that you have in deeper neural networks when you compute the gradients naively. And then by using kind of BILRP and choosing uh, appropriate um, hyperparameters, you can end up actually with like some um, a quite good match to the ground truth data in your explanations. Um, and this is how we could, at least to some extent, confirm that the method is doing something useful and we can now move to more real world examples. Um, so this we did in like the very standard uh, VGG16 network that's printed on image classification. And it's basically a very standard way in the community to kind of extract visual features from any type of input. And you can do it, you can do all types of visualizations with these representations, any kind of um, information retrieval tasks, similarity tasks. Um, so it's kind of quite widely used, but people typically don't question what the similarity score that they re receive um, is based upon. So let's look at a few examples of what uh, we have seen. So here in the first row, we see um, similarity um, interact uh, interactions of this that are um, responsible for the um, similarity score between features. Uh, first, in kind of a self-similarity case. So basically, here you have like kind of perfect similarity, of course. Um, and the interactions that are most relevant, why it's similar to itself, are like kind of the classical kind of cat-like features. So the ears and the mouth, the eyes. Um, similar also, this works for kind of um, images from the same class, but with different examples. So kind of the birds are really attentive to the interaction of the eye features. And also for kind of plane classes, we kind of see a bit more complex structure, but generally you kind of have an interaction between uh, windows, the front of the plane, and between the two images. And so you can clearly see here that this gives you additional information to just having, for example, heat maps for the two uh, respective images. Uh, that would tell you, of course, the features that are relevant, but not really the interaction that's causing um, the similarity score to um, arise. Now, in the second row, we have some examples that are maybe less clear, because here we also use examples from different classes. So here we, ex we observed quite high similarity scores between uh, a horse example and some sheep. And there we observed that the similarity that we observe is attributed to like the similar kind of um, shape of, of the face of the of a black kind of sheep and a, and a kind of brown horse. So that might be really unexpected and you might not want to kind of be recommended uh, a sheep when you're looking for a query for a horse. Um, and also here we have, for example, an example where we have quite low similarity and all, there's no clear pattern arising um, of why these two images would be similar. So this is kind of the case when you don't have a lot of clear evidence, you will get these really confusing and contradicting evidence patterns. And maybe one uh, last example to highlight um, why this is important, uh, because of course similarity is kind of a very vague concept and humans can have different ideas what they expect to be um, the, the cause for similarity. So for example, here you could just expect that the similarity is mostly based between the kind of adult cows um, because they are kind of visually, to me at least, most similar. But like um, what we see is that, for example, some of the neural networks have learned to focus more on like similar color, for example. And so here, the most relevant part in this um, pairing is um, 
the color of the fur, so basically only white cows contribute to the similarity score, and this might be a strategy of the model that you might not have expected. Um, so the model here is biased to over-attend and over-focus um, on, on, on kind of color. Um, yes, so with this, uh, we will now use, uh, continue with the first use case, and we will continue with a bit of history. Um, so, yeah, you've probably seen, that, like, uh, or like Matteo mentioned, that there's a lot of kind of mathematical um, computational tables in the Sphera um, data set that um, is used um, um, by, by Matteo's group and colleagues. And there's roughly about like 10,000 of these numerical tables um, in kind of, an, I don't know, I think from 80,000 roughly. So like almost 10% of the, of the content of these books is numerical tables. And when we first met with Matteo, he kind of told us about it and said, okay, this kind of type of data has never been analyzed because it's just impossible for a historian or any human uh, for that matter to really go and cluster these tables because you actually really have to need to compare every single digit that is occurring in every of the page. And yeah, this is kind of infeasible in, uh, in, 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 in a historian's life. Um, so we kind of wanted to, to find a way of training a network to represent these tables. Um, of course, unfortunately, we have like, not a lot of data. The data was unlabeled when we first saw it. And we also really, you can't ask historians to fully kind of annotate these types of tables. It's way too costly. So we kind of broke the problem down into simpler uh, sub-problems and really focus first on just designing a model that's able to detect single digits. So we basically collected a small ground truth of, zero, of, of digits from zero to nine that we then trained um, a model on. Um, and then from this, we built more complex feature extractors that are able to detect these type of bigrams. So basically we are aiming to represent our complex composition of like a lot of um, digits by just using um, a signal um, that represents kind of these composition of two digits, um, 0, 1, 21, um, these type of things. So you get kind of roughly 100 features that you use to build histograms then. So this is kind of the whole kind of data set. And here we kind of extract um, using our model these histograms. So we roughly count uh, how many of these biograms occur in a, in a page. And we found that this kind of bag of biograms approach is actually somewhat robust to detect the very similar tables in our data set. Um, of course, if you then now kind of just use these histograms and find the most similar tables in the data set, you really want to make sure that, you, that the model uses the correct features to build the similarity. And this is, again, where historians are very critical and they really want to understand um, the process underlying the model. So we kind of did that with our um, Bigram model and we kind of tested with BioLRP if these kind of patterns are the ones that we would uh, have expected. And we indeed see that the similarity score uh, between these two tables, for example, um, on this small patch is grounded in like the bigrams. So we have like matching patterns between 38 and 38. And since we pool over spatial dimensions, we can also have like um, kind of this kind of more complicated or like more diverse matchings between different locations, but they are still the same digits, so 12, 12, and 12. Um, so it kind of really grounds its, its prediction strategy on the desired features. In contrast, uh, we have looked at the uh, VGG layers, uh, intermediate layer kind of representation, um, which actually gave us a very similar similarity score. So you can actually retrieve often the same table with, with like an untrained, um, or like a not fine-tuned VGG um, network. But like then you, we discovered that the features that it's using are not um, the ones that you would expect. And it's mostly feature um, basing its um, prediction strategy on like background features or kind of small kind of lines, circular objects, um, and just features that are not really robust predictors of um, similarity scoring. So here we could really verify that the model that we've designed with like very limited annotated data um, works as desired and clearly outperforms like a naive approach um, as we saw here. Um, you know, going a bit further with this, we have uh, seen um, that these kind of books in, in general um, have been printed all over Europe. And uh, Matteo has kind of shown a more general analysis. Um, but here in this small um, um, study, we've looked at um, to what extent kind of the numerical tables have distributed through uh, all over Europe and where, for example, different um, scientifically relevant um, effects could occur. So in order to do this, um, we looked at several cities, um, or like for every city, we kind of um, computed these representations. 
and we performed a clustering um, in this kind of representation space that's using the bigram representations. And using these, then we were able to compute um, a cluster entropy. So this means this distribution gives you, um, in a way, a fingerprint of how diverse the content was a certain city was able to produce. So if, like for example, a city only produces one type of table, you will just get one big peak here because they're all clustered in one, um, in one um, cluster index. And this will then speak like, uh, a lot about like, diversity and innovation in, in this city. So we use this approach to then look more into um, what city had kind of the most innovative uh, print kind of agenda. And we found um, this to be like the result. And we see kind of two kind of really lowest kind of entropy um, cities, which are Frankfurt and Wittenberg. And they are kind of the cities that have the most repetition in, in material that they print um, for two very distinct reasons. Um, so Matteo nicely kind of laid out when we had the meeting about it, that like Frankfurt, uh, for example, is a center for reprinting editions. So there, Frankfurt apparently specialized to just reusing the same um, books over and over again and just giving out a lot of editions with the same material. Uh, probably for economic reasons, I guess, but I don't know. Um, but Wittenberg, uh, which we've already heard previously about, um, was kind of uh, reformed by Protestants, and there basically the curriculum of the books that were um, put into press uh, were under political control. So there, like political um, figures, really decided very actively what type of content should be printed. And this is why we here get like um, a quite low diversity in, in, in the content of print in comparison to the rest of Europe. So with this, kind of we could um, generate hypotheses um, in in history that also match kind of what the historians uh, believed and know, knew about the corpus um, using machine learning and also explaining by AI. Um, so yeah, to summarize this first part of similarity, we kind of saw that the structure of similarity models um, results in second order explanations um, that we've called BILRP. Um, these highlight the relevance of interaction of features um, in like unsupervised settings. And it enables us to get insights into, into these type of data settings um, and gives us very detailed explanations. Okay, with this, I would now um, continue uh, and give some more insight on like uh, graph neural networks. Um, so these are structures that have been quite um, successful all over a lot of different scientific um, communities because they represent data in, in, in structured ways, which for example in um, the molecular sciences, physical sciences, but also in language processing and a lot of other communities has really gained a lot of interest. Um, yeah, and this is work um, that uh, we did with Thomas and also uh, Grigor and a lot of other of, of our colleagues. And I will just uh, present some of the more um, um, use cases that we are able to do with this. Uh, so to give uh, or maybe repeat some of the things that Grégoire yesterday already said is so the, what's really specific about graph neural networks is that your, your input graph is repeatedly represented throughout your whole graph neural network. So you kind of have uh, this multiplicative factor that goes into the layer-wise computations um, throughout um, your network before you make a, a prediction at the end, which can be like a regression or classification problem. And then each interaction, you kind of do some kind of aggregating and combine um, functions that are yeah, kind of specific to the type of graph neural network that you're um, using. So then again, uh, then you end up with this kind of really nested structure where the, as I said, the adjacency matrix or like the input graph or the structure of the problem is re-encoded at each step of your neural network, uh, which is here denominated by T. Um, and then uh, what we found is that kind of this type of problems are well represented by work-based work -based relevance. So basically when you decompose your, this kind of function and go iterative, iteratively back through the layers, you first end up with an attribution on nodes. If you go one back further closer to the input, you end up with this you know, second order interactions as, we, as in BILRP, for example. And the further you go, the longer your walks get. So basically, we have kind of an exponential increase in the number of, of, of walks that you kind of observed to traverse um, your network. So this gives you really uh, fine um, and complex um, explanations that give you a good idea of what exactly the interactions in your network are uh, throughout the different uh, processing layers. Yeah, and we found that um, instead of having to compute kind of really higher order um, gradients, you could simplify the problem by yeah, formalizing the problem as like a work-based um, um, problem where you then can compute your um, 
relevance terms by just sequentially applying LRP computations and just applying um, some masking in the respective layers. Uh, looks a bit complicated, but in practice, it's, it's much easier <laughs> to do it like that. Um, um, and again, we kind of end up, uh, or we can design a simple baseline, which is again our gradient times input based version of GNN um, LRP called GNNGI. Um, and then again, if you do like a depaler decomposition um, and really decompose and design your propagation rules to be more robust, you end up with a GNN LRP formulation, where for each type of graph neural network, you have specific propagation rules that Gregor showed yesterday in his overview table. Um, and yeah, since this is quite time consuming for deeper networks, um, fortunately, we are now able to also compute this in linear time. So now, in this kind of formulation, the a number of computations that you have to make go grow exponentially throughout your network depth. Um, in this kind of uh, very recent um, subgraph attribution scheme of GNN NLRP, uh, we are now able to get um, these explanations in linear time complexity with respect to the LRP depth. So yeah, as you can see, uh, we kind of yeah, there's a lot of kind of work in this direction to use these gene um, explanations and really get higher order explanations in robust and also kind of feasible, fast and computable ways. Um, yeah, we've already seen yesterday that like, the evaluation of these things is not trivial because you cannot just flip like a single pixel as you would typically do in pixel flipping, but instead we need to kind of flip subgraphs um, in, your, in your explanation space because they are so much more complex and consist of walks. Um, but just like conceptually, you kind of still remove kind of uh, the interaction, the interactive effect of several features and test how strongly the network is being activated in order to measure a good, if the explanation technique that you are trying to test gives you a really steep increase in, in um, prediction um, score or like in prediction probability. And so you want like a high area under the curve, um, which will give you a, a really good explanation. And we can see that um, gene NLRP is quite successful at that in comparison to like simpler kind of uh, first order explanations um, as here, or like to more standard um, graph neural network explainers, for example, GNN explainer. Um, and you can do the same thing also for pruning tasks. So basically you remove the least relevant features and want to minimally affect the network prediction. So it's more a measure of, of robustness and sensitivity. And also here we see that it's quite robust and it makes a lot of sense um, to use these higher order features um, to get better explanations. Okay, but this was just to show you and like to <laughs> gain your trust in, into these explanations. Uh, we will now first look into um, uh, use case where we revisit this image classification. So um, while we kind of thought about what problems we, can, we could apply this to, we uh, turned to CNNs because CNNs, as you've seen, are widely used um, and they can be formalized as GNNs um, that operate on pixel lattices. So this means that the node in this GNN would now represent a, a basically like a receptive field in your CNN. And this then allows us to analyze the relevance flow um, across different processing blocks in your um, neural network. And then we can visualize this as a vector field on top of the um, input image to understand exactly how information flows throughout these different encoding blocks. So maybe to make this a bit more clear. Uh, so this is kind of the standard kind of heat map type explanations that you would get typically. So you just get uh, a single relevance score for each of your nodes. Well, this, yeah, and this is kind of definitely insightful, but it doesn't really give you a very detailed uh, notion about what's happening inside of the processing block. So using our kind of higher order explanations, we are now able to kind of directly highlight where the information is flowing throughout this block and kind of where the information is uh, maybe condensing towards. So with GNN, GNN GI, so our gradient um, naive computation, um, we kind of see that, yeah, the, we get this kind of uh, flow field, but it's like somewhat, um, lacking robustness, so it's a bit all over the place, again, due to the kind of shattering of gradients um, and like the, that's caused by the depth of the neural networks. Um, so if we kind of use our improved schemes, uh, here Gene and LRP, we kind of see how the um, flow field is uh, much more regular and um, points clearly towards certain areas in your input of this teapot image, for example, that um, then this processing block is now focusing much more on so I think this becomes even clearer if you look at it um, in the course of several processing blocks. So if you look at early layer 
like block three, which is a somewhat early layer, but it probably still focuses on more lower level concepts like edges. You see that most of the relevant fields focus on like the outside borders of your um, teapot and maybe some specific curvatures. Um, then in the next processing block, you see how information already starts to converge to specific higher level concepts. So for example, like the, the knob on the lid or like the kind of um, handle here or like the, the lip of the, uh, this part here of the teapot at the, at the front. And then in the later block, uh, very close to the classification, you see how all of these fields kind of start to represent one singular concept. Um, because yeah, you need like a, a holistic representation, of course, to make like a, a kind of a classification decision in the end. Um, so yeah, this gives you a lot of insight. Um, and with this, we could also uncover um, an un unexpected feature encoding that was already well known in the community. So basically an effect of kind of spurious correlations in your training data set. So here you have kind of an image of a dumbbell um, and a person kind of lifting these with um, her arm, I think. Um, and you see that again, early on, you kind of have this representation in terms of um, outside e edges of your objects. And then the further you go, there's kind of a convergence towards specific parts of interest. Uh, whereas here you kind of have like a one that focuses on the weight of the dumbbell and then another one kind of focuses more on like the lower arm or the wrist. But then what you suddenly see then in the last step is that all of these kind of force fields or like these like relevance fields kind of converge to one um, point. So basically here you have like the a, a, a joint um, concept that emerges that's like consists of the dumbbell and the arm. So basically your model makes the decision um, of classifying a dumbbell also based on the presence of the arm itself. Um, yeah, we've seen similar examples in, in Wojciech's talk where the frisbee is only detected because when the dog is there and these types of things. Uh, so yeah, here we can clearly pinpoint in what kind of block this happens. Uh, so likely uh, around here is, is where you kind of lose the separation between the two objects. Um, yeah, and now to um, a second use case example where we use higher order interactions in natural language processing. Um, so yeah, we've see nicely in Andre's talk that there's a lot of structure in natural language and it's like quite well suited to graph problems. Uh, so in order to apply it to our higher order explanations, we've trained like a two layer graph neural network on movie reviews. Um, so a sentiment task where you just ask people, is this a positive movie review or a negative movie review? And then uh, in order to understand what happens, we extract again our graph walks that represent the joint interaction between words. So maybe first as a, as, a, as a primer, we kind of can also neglect any type of interactions and end up again with these kind of heat map type representations where um, you kind of get positive contributions for words, words like like, because usually you like something. Um, certainly best seen, these seem to be attributes that typically give you a positive um, classification for movie review. But of course, it's kind of not able to kind of understand the negation that didn't like is then a negative thing because it cannot use higher order information because it's not allowed to do so. Um, but by using higher order interactions now, we can really highlight um, the, the power of having these, um, yeah, the interactive structure and allowing the model to learn also more complex patterns. So here, for example, this whole kind of first part of the sentence uh, I didn't like, at first I didn't like the boring pictures is contributing negatively um, because yeah, it kind of has learned that the negation um, of didn't like kind of make, kind of turns the whole sentence negative. Whereas the second part of the movie uh, review, but it's certainly one of the best moves I've ever seen kind of contributes con uh, positively. So you get a much more fine grained um, explanation that suits much more the, the complexity in, in, that we see in, in language. Um, and we have a, a few more examples here um, where we highlight specific kind of flaws of, of language, um, or like of, of our model at least, uh, but these often reoccur also in larger models, um, where we have an incorrect prediction for the sentence, you'll be more entertained getting hit by a bus. So here the model has learned that the whole sentence contributes positively and all the interactions are mostly positive. But uh, it kind of still kind of misclassifies it because it just doesn't understand the concept of irony. So uh, yeah, because I think it's hard to, to code these things into, into language. 
And here in the second example, the sentence Hugh Grant and Sandra Bullock are two such likable act actors. We see that these models often are quite um, overfitted and overconfident in, in specific entities. So for example, the interaction of Hugh and Grant, so Hugh Grant as an actor, contributes positively to the um, review, whereas Sandra Bullock apparently always contributes negatively. So yeah, we have these effects of um, negative interactions that are not really reflecting um, yeah, the ground truth or like basically what we would expect the model to learn. Um, so yeah, I hope I convinced you that like, with these kind of higher order explanations, we can give a lot of more complexity and insights into our model structures. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the structure of GNNs results in higher order explanations, which we call GNN NLP. Uh, we can evaluate them, but we need kind of to update our evaluation techniques. But like in short, we just need to kind of uh, flip subgroups uh, of, of uh, interacting features. And like the relevant works offer a detailed and faithful um, explanation of the graph that then we can hopefully use for insight generation in the future. Um, so yeah, now in the um, third part of the talk, I will look into transformer models. Um, so um, we did collaborate with our colleagues in Tel Aviv University around uh, Ali Amin and uh, Leo Wolf um, to really robustify and have a kind of critical look at how we can explain transformer um, explanations. And uh, we then in a second kind of um, study, we kind of took these um, improved <laughs> explanations, like small uh, spoiler, uh, to kind of get some insight into um, cognition and natural language processing. But first, let's see how we can develop better explanations. So we've uh, already seen this morning how transformer models are built. So basically, you have an input sequence, and you have a succession of several of these attention blocks. Um, and then at the very output of your several encoding uh, blocks, you get like a sequence that you then use for prediction. And each of these attention blocks kind of consists of roughly two kind of uh, modules. So like an attention head module, uh, which is basically just a self-attention um, idea that you learn to nonlinear weight your um, input features, and like a second layer norm step that serves for normalization purposes. Um, yes, and with this kind of basic structure, one would naively do something like gradient times input to understand uh, what happens, but probably more obvious would be to just directly in analyze the um, attention patterns. So uh, the hope with um, self-attentive models and transformers initially was that we can just use the attention um, weights that we learn and directly understand what the model is doing and what features are most relevant. Unfortunately, more and more evidence has come in in recent years that this is not a great strategy and it doesn't usually reflect the model uh, processing very faithfully. So just looking at the attention scores is typically not the best strategy that you can do in order to understand what your model is doing. Okay, so then people have thought of, okay, what can we do instead? Um, so, and one kind of really popular and successful approach was to use gradients to understand uh, the model computations. So if we just compute kind of the gradient times um, input kind of naive approach, we end up with a set of formulas that um, give us uh, attribution of the output scoring with respect to the inputs. And you can do this, of course, for each transformer block um, here. So you can do kind of a layer-wise backpropagation throughout your different layers. Um, and end up with a relevant attribution. And what's important here is that there can be like, there's lots of desired principles for explanations, but one of them is conservation. So this is the idea that what you put, uh, what you predict at the output of your network, so basically your logit score or whatever you're predicting at the output, um, needs to be kind of preserved throughout the propagation procedure. So you can kind of compare it to kind of, you have some amount of water at the output of your kind of channel network and you put it in at the end and you want to observe the same amount of water at the input of your network because you don't want the water to disappear all of a sudden or to kind of emerge all of a sudden inside of your network. So good explanation techniques typically kind of fulfill this conservation principle um, in order to yeah, give you a, um, a robust and meaningful explanation. And we kind of tested this conservation property for this kind of naive computation using gradient times input and we saw Unfortunately, these are kind of not correlated. So here you can see the output score of your model in comparison to the sum of what you um, observe at the input. So these are your explanations over your input sequences. And you just sum all the contributions and you see there's basically no correlation anymore. Um, 
between the output function you're explaining and what you see at the input. So yeah, unfortunately, gradient times input is not very useful in this kind of naive uh, formalization. And we kind of, yeah, look more into why and where this occurs, this kind of non-conservative and where kind of the conservation participates um, into. And we found that attention heads are one of the factors. So in order to kind of develop this, you just analyze your attention head in, in detail. So you want to kind of um, formalize um, the gradient computation, so you yeah, just apply the chain rule to understand how the different components contribute to the gradient. And you uh, write down like, a solution for it. And then you can get to this formula where you want to have the conservation between the relevance at the output of your um, attention block should sum to the inputs of your two um, um, yeah, x and x prime inputs into your block. Uh, but you can see here that this isn't fulfilled as long as this whole part isn't zero. And typically this part is zero because it contains covariates between Q and X. And yeah, this is exactly what you're trying to learn. So if this was zero, your learning problem wouldn't really teach you much. Um, so yeah, there's a problem and we've identified that these covariates are the reason for it. Um, so in order to solve it, we could uh, reuse an, an, a trick that was developed in the context of LSTMs uh, by uh, Wojciech and um, Laila Aras. Um, and basically the idea is that you kind of detach this whole branch. So this whole branch here is just there to compute your attention weights. So at the output of this, you just learn a set of coefficients that tell you how to weight your inputs x here. Um, so if we consider these then to just, to just be constant, so basically you can just look at it as a neural network layer and just assume that these are weights that you've learned, but instead we now just computed them in the forward pass, but still we can assume them to be constant. And then if we detach them in the forward pass, we kind of, um, again, reconstitute um, conservation. And yeah, this is kind of the approach that we use for the attention head to improve conservation. And the second um, point where this kind of conservation um, was not fulfilled is in the layer norms. Um, I'm yeah, going not to go into all the details, but um, we found that um, the kind of normalization function where you kind of center and um, standardize your data uh, breaks conservation due to this kind of um, denominator here. And again, we apply the same trick. So by just detaching this denominator, we can again reconstitute conservation and get to an improved propagation scheme of the gradient computation. And we can, of course, uh, test this um, again in these kind of conservation plots. So this is um, if you apply the gradient times input baseline to two different data sets. So SST and IMDb are both data sets for movie uh, review classification. Uh, so this is, again, the pattern that we've already seen. Um, and it kind of replicates also to other data sets. Um, and now if we kind of apply our layer normalization rule and detach the denominator, we see that it already improves a bit. And at least it follows the line a bit better. If we apply the attention head um, rule and detach um, the kind of attention scores, um, we kind of really massively decrease the spread of, of, of the conservation um, distribution. But like only the combination of the layer norm and the attention head rules really is able to give you an, a result that follows the ground truth that you would expect uh, more closely. And like the remaining tilt that you see here is due to the biases in your network. So if you set all your biases in your um, in your linear layers to zero, then you would get like a perfect conservation. Um, unfortunately, we cannot do much about these biases, so we need to accept that there's a small kind of uh, discrepancy in the conservation. But this already gives you quite kind of reliable explanations, as we will see in the next part. So again, we do kind of our flipping analysis here. It's much easier because we can just do standard pixel flipping, but in this case, we flip words. Um, and by removing kind of the most relevant words, oh no, so here in this case, we want to add the most relevant words to an empty sequence to get the correct classification. And here we see that LRP uh, with our improved rules gives us the, clearly the best performance, whereas, for example, gradient times input is somewhere in between, but flipping according to attention. Um, scoring, so basically the hope that kind of transformers had at the beginning, that you could just use the attention scores, does give you very kind of, yeah, unsatisfying performance. So you really get explanations that are not really able to explain the model predictions very faithfully. And yeah, we could kind of also show this for pruning. So if you want to remove the least relevant features, your model should also kind of be able to not change its prediction very strongly. And we saw, um, we see this in this plot. So okay, now having uh, access to these kind of improved explanations of transformer models, we are now um, 
equipped to go into more use cases. And here we investigated um, the case of uh, bias in transformers, and we used kind of a really standard community used um, the Stillbird model that uses, um, um, yeah, when we used <laughs> explainable AI um, with, with our improved uh, rules um, to test what type of features in the input were most relevant and to then make like a um, analysis of if certain features, in this case gender, plays a role to make a prediction more positive or negative in, again in movie reviews. So in order to understand this, we kind of did not explain directly the classification, but the difference between the two classes. So this then gives you just a more direct way of understanding what kind of gender or like what gendered names in affect the classification more towards a positive review versus what names do more correspond to like a negative movie review. Uh, so we did this kind of across kind of a, a small data set um, and tested the relevance that lies on female or male names in these movie reviews and we see there's no consistent kind of gender bias at least. Um, so on average kind of you get something where male and female names both kind of contribute a little bit um, but there's no kind of super um, strong gender bias at least. But if we kind of go more into kind of a ranking, so and we kind of extract all the names and see what names do most positively versus most negatively affect the prediction, we do indeed see some patterns um, that we probably are not happy with. Um, for example, the, the patterns that most strongly encourage a positive prediction are all kind of male Western um, names like Lee, Barry, Raphael or Brothers. Uh, Cohen brothers versus kind of the most negatively connotated um, names are kind of political leaders like Saddam Hussein or Castro um, or non-Western family names like che Jackie Chan um, and also kind of f female names like Martha Stewart. But again, mostly due to her male kind of last name. <laughs> um, so yeah, there is some effects, but like uh, we, we need to go into the details to understand uh, where these biases occur. Uh, yeah, and we would like to do much more in this direction, but this is just the start. And also, like maybe you're familiar with it, but bias in, in language models is often tested in this kind of template-based fashion. So usually you have kind of these kind of templates, and you kind of flip certain names. You kind of uh, do like, oh, uh, Sandra is a great actor versus I don't know, Martin is a great actor, and you kind of just test this. But of course, if you kind of design these types of templates, you're never really sure if you're still on the training manifold, so you might be off the manifold, and this um, could result in instabilities um, in your analysis, and I think there's really been more and more work that shows that using these templates is not the most robust way to evaluate these types of um, biases. So this is an alternative approach where we can directly kind of attribute to the inputs in the training set. Okay, and now like a, a second use case uh, that we did with uh, collaborators at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, I'm kind of reusing uh, something that uh, Bole had already shown uh, on Monday. So basically this idea of humans and models learn different strategies and likely there's some overlap where the models align, but there's probably still like a lot of um, strategies that the human uh, have um, domain expertise about and strategies that are only the models are using. And in this kind of cognitive study, we wanted to see um, how well humans and models align in like a natural language task. So we kind of have used eye tracking data for 12 English native speakers on sentiment reading and uh, relation extraction on Wikipedia. And we kind of formalized attention um, by using the total fixation times that participants spent um, on a certain part of the sentence while reading these. Um, and then we wanted to compare to a set of um, yeah, a broad set of natural language models. Um, so mostly here we focus on transformers, so the standard kind of baseline for modern language, which is BERT probably still. <laughs> uh, and we wanted to look at different um, strategies, how we can extract relevance patterns by using raw attention, by using attention flow, like another technique to get explanations, um, and also our improved LRP rules. Um, and then if we do this and compare kind of the correlation, so if we could directly compare like the human patterns um, to kind of the different patterns that the models have given us, we can see that for the same model, so all these kind of highlighted models here are all the same model, so it's all BERT, but like, the result really extremely heavily depends on the explanation strategy that you've been using. So for example, if you use this kind of flow, which is one of the most kind of, I think, widely used um, explanation techniques for transformers, you get like a very high um, correlation to the human um, attentions. Whereas, for example, the, the most faithful model that we've just presented, so kind of using uh, 
BERT LRP gives you a much lower um, correlation. And of course, this shows very clearly that um, the choice of explanation um, technique really can heavily um, affect the insights that you get from the models. So here we found that, for example, these types of explanation techniques that are less faithful, so they are less able to represent the model function, um, they give you a much less sparse um, relevance attribution, whereas, for example, uh, the LRP technique is very specific, so it really identifies singular words um, that are most relevant. And this is something how humans don't work typically. So human, hum, humans read a sentence, they first kind of look at everything for a little bit, and then they focus maybe again on the most specific words. But yeah, so this basically just means that like humans <laughs> and uh, models probably still don't work alike, uh, because humans are usually very broad in their analysis of, 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 of while reading. Uh, whereas models are typically very kind of tuned to only detect the patterns that are most relevant. And we can reveal them, for example, with like faithful explanation techniques like we've shown here. And yeah, I uh, hope with this uh, I convinced you that yeah, we really need to be very um, careful with, with like choosing explanation methods and also how we construct our evaluation techniques um, in order to use explainable AI for the sciences. Uh, so to summarize this part, so naive transformer explanations are typically not relevance conserving and are also not very faithful. So you probably shouldn't use them <laughs> um, or at least be kind of careful. Um, attention has and layer normalization are like the reason why these kind of gradient computations break conservation. And yeah, you need faithful and robust explanations uh, for insight discovery because otherwise you kind of build your um, insights on effects that don't represent the model function properly. Yes, and with this, I'd like to uh, conclude that yeah, we need to carefully analyze our model structures. Um, second and higher order explanations are kind of the appropriate explanation um, class for deep similarity models, for example, and also for graph neural networks. Um, also, relevance conservation is like an important thing to check when you use explanation techniques, um, at least like as a first kind of idea. And of course, more kind of um, flipping type analysis are usually advised before you build insights on your um, explanations. And yeah, this will allow you to get more uh, towards more safe and robust use of machine learning to kind of generate insights and also really make um, progress in sensitive um, domains. And yeah, I hope I uh, could convince you that this was like an interesting direction of research. And yeah, please have um, um, ideas <laughs> and uh, come yeah, towards me with um, yeah, application areas because yeah, we've just developed these methods um, to also apply them to a wide range of tasks. So if you have any ideas or um, questions, go ahead now. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>